Hi. I'm glad you could make it. I should introduce myself. My name is Giles Abbott and I am a professional storyteller. What I'm going to do today is tell a story. In 1997 I was commissioned by the wonderful festival, the Festival at the Edge. If you don't know it, I really recommend you look it up. To create a new story for adults. And when I say a new story, of course what they wanted was a a new telling of a traditional story. And I chose a story which in its earliest forms is probably Iron Age. Think about that. This story was new at a time when the equivalent of an iPod as a cool gizmo, the equivalent of the eye slate, was an iron knife. That's how old the first versions of this story are. So the academic title of this story, it's part of the Ulster Cycle, one of the treasures of Irish storytelling. Irish storytelling is, of course, one of the greatest, greatest traditions in the world. And this is one of the sorrows of storytelling. It's, it's, its academic title is the third sorrow of storytelling, the sons of Wishnach. Well, interesting that academics would name it after three men. And of course they do play a big part in the story, but most people know this story by its main female character. They know this story as the story of Deirdre, or Deirdre of the Sorrows. And that's certainly how I thought of it. So three years ago I wrote this version. I say wrote, that's not true. Because, yeah, I did take some written notes when I began my composition process having first of all explored various different sources, all of which treated the story in very different ways. Having, yes, I did make some written notes, but I have not a written script. I don't work with a written script. The words that I'm going to be using as I tell this story for you are going to be coming into my mouth as I breathe, as I think. Kind of as a jazz player would work. A jazz player would know the song, would know the bars, would know the choruses, and then the rest would be of the moment and for the moment. Well, this is similar. I know the story. I know what has to happen. But I don't yet know how I'm going to tell it to you. Not quite. And I'm going to take some risks today. I always do, just to keep it fresh. So there may be times during this telling when my words get tangled in my teeth or I stumble and... If you're used to watching actors, if you're used to listening to audiobooks, that will surprise you. But you can take it as a sign that what's happening is happening right here, right now, for you. right now I should get straight to the point and tell you that that night in Awan Maka if you'd have heard a pin drop it would have deafened you that night in the hall of the Red Branch those men the warriors of the Red Branch men who knew it was better by far to live a short and a glorious life than to die the ignominious death of old age. They were listening like children. Now these were men that would risk everything, even their lives, in boasting contests, all to establish which of them was the bravest, the most courageous, the most daring, the most heroic, which of them should be awarded the champion's portion the sweetest cut of meat taken from the pig carcasses which were turning even that moment over the open fires. I can tell you at that moment even the flames licking the hog carcasses seemed to burn. Hushed. Even the king, Connor MacNessa, king of Ulster, even he was silent, still, his face rapt with wonder. Why? Because Phelim 
was talking. Phelan MacDoyle, the king's storyteller, so without rival at his craft, that not only did the king have him tell stories at his many feasts and banquets, but also privileged him with living accommodation amongst the warriors of the Red Branch, the pinnacle of society at that time. Now all of that week, Phelan had been telling stories from the epic cycle of Fionn McCool and his leadership of the Fianna, that mighty war band. Well, the warriors knew these stories. They'd been brought up on them, but they loved them, and particularly when the teller was as good as Phelan. On this occasion, the warriors' attention was particularly acute, because Phelan was telling one of their favourite stories, the story of the love of Dermot and Gronje. He'd already told them how Fionn himself, now an old man with a long life and a reputation as the best and the wisest of leaders and the strongest and most courageous of warriors, in old age Fionn had decided that he wanted to marry again and how his eye had fallen on Gronje, the beautiful young daughter of Cormac, the High King, the Ard Ree of Ireland. The king had been delighted. Fionn as a son-in-law was an excellent idea. So it was, oh, he told them all of this, and he told them how it all had gone wrong. How Gronje had fallen in love with Dermot, the finest of Fionn's young warriors. How the two of them had run away together the night before that Gronje was supposed to marry Fionn. How Fionn had woken from a drugged sleep and realised that his bride was plucked. He told them all of this, and how... Fionn had gone after the runaways like a ravening wolf, harrying them from their hiding places in the forests, in the trees, in the caves and in the cliffs of Ireland. Phelim had told his listeners how everywhere that Dermot and Gronje lay down together, Mother Earth herself, honouring their love, had made a bed for them, a bed of thick moss picked out with the most bright, imaginable flowers. And he told them how these beds of Dermot and Grani were still to be found in the woodlands of Ireland, evidence of their fugitive love. And it warned them. It warned any against using them for the satisfaction of a meaner love. Because, let's say, another ordinary couple were to come across these beautiful beds of moss with the brightest imaginable flowers, lie down and then use them for the... a meaner, a baser pleasure. They wouldn't regret it for long because Mother Earth would shoot out sharp briars to snare and throttle any who so offended against the love, their example, the love of Dermot and Grony. He told them all of this. And he told them that after more than a year of such a fugitive life, Fionn's warriors, the Fianna, had prevailed upon Fionn to forgive them and call the runaways home. This done, Dermot and Grony returned to Great and joyful celebration. But, Phelan was asking, how sincere was Fionn's forgiveness? Would he really forego his vengeance? Well, Phelan was just getting to this last and darkest twist in the tale when a messenger burst in, broke the spell completely. That whole invisible world that hung quivering between Teller and listener just <laughs> disappeared, destroyed in that moment. The messenger burst in. His news was important, was exciting. His news was that Phelan's wife had been safely delivered of her baby, a girl. Well, the warriors had been about to rise up in fury at having their story interrupted, found that fury transformed in that instant into joy, a joy of equal force. And now little Phelan found himself surrounded by enormous men, pounding his back, shaking his hand, embracing him, hugging him, almost fighting each other to be the next and the best in congratulation. The king, King Connor, as a gesture of royal congratulation, asked his druid, Kofa, to forecast the girl's future. The druid rose from his seat and the rising of the druid and a rustling of robes quietened the warriors. Her name is Deirdre. 
and she will grow so beautiful as will give beauty itself a new name. Well, the applause was thunderous, and now men really were fighting each other to be the next and the most fulsome in congratulation for Phelim. Phelim's face had broken into an almost idiotically happy smile. But the druid hadn't finished. Because of this great beauty, kings and chieftains will fight great battles, warriors, bitter duels. This beauty will drown in the blood of men. Rivers of blood will flow through the kingdom of Ulster, and all because of this beauty. The silence was deafening. It was broken eventually by first one voice, but picked up and echoed by others until it became a roaring hubbub of voices. It's obvious, Your Majesty. Kill her now. Yes, kill her. Put her to death. Spare us this hardship. Yes, kill her. Kill her. Kill her now. Kill her. We'll do it. We'll do it. Where is she? The king silenced the warriors with a gesture of his hand and spoke, announcing that he would do no such thing. He would not kill that child. Instead, in order that this great beauty could be not a curse but a blessing to the kingdom of Ulster, he would have her taken away this very night. He would have her raised in secret in a secluded place by his own nursemaid, Lavachan. And when she came of age, he would marry her himself, thus making her Queen of Ulster. Well, the warriors congratulated the king on his wisdom, on his mercy, and fell back to congratulating Phelim, who now was in a different part of the stronghold. Phelim's wife was waiting to introduce her new baby to her husband. Oh, look at you. Look at you. Phelim won't mind you being a girl. No, he won't. Not when he sees how perfect you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you. You're so pretty. She looked up in surprise and saw in the doorway her husband looking grim, washed out, and flanking him a couple of enormous warriors. Phelim approached his wife, and tenderly, gently, he took the baby from his wife's arms, and he fell in love the moment he touched her flawless skin. He cooed at her, he burbled at her, he inhaled the smell from the top of her head. And then he turned and handed her to the warriors. Who themselves turned and left, leaving Phelim to explain to his thunderstruck wife about the Druid's prophecy, the King's decision, and how they, the parents, would play no further part in their baby's life. And so, old Lavachan was brought out of her retirement and given this task, that of raising the King's future wife. But it was no task. Honestly, Deirdre grew so fast into a funny, affectionate, energetic, quick witted No, she was intelligent, a very intelligent child. And she was so pretty. And the bond between the nursemaid and her charge grew very deep. In fact, for Lavachan, 15 years seemed to fly past. For the king, they seemed to creep. During Deirdre's childhood, 
The king would send messengers to the remote farmhouse that he'd selected for them to rear his future wife. And the messengers would come back and report to the king on how the girl was growing, I suppose in much the same way that a rich man who's sellered a vintage of fine wine will get an annual report from the sellers describing the maturation and development of his investment. Well, as Deirdre grew, the messenger's descriptions became more and more wonder-filled. Sometimes the king could still see that they were starry-eyed, even after their long journey back to his court. And the king began to visit in person. And every time he did, the girl's heart-stopping beauty seemed to magnify far beyond the measure of anything he could have imagined. And he grew eager for satisfaction. Lavachan had to counsel patience. Oh no, not yet, your majesty. I think it would be best to wait for another year at least. Another year? Why do I have to wait so long? Well, your majesty will understand the wisdom, I'm sure, of, of not picking his fruit before it is ripe. Yes, but as I look at her now, I saw her earlier, she seems to me, she seems to me, how can I put it, in, in bud. And I, of course I can understand your majesty thinking so, but development doesn't take place all over all at once, if your majesty understands me. It would be a little like taking a cake from the oven too soon, if your majesty understands me. Yeah, of course, of course I understand. Of course the king understood nothing of the sort, but he was prevailed upon to wait for another year. The king gone, and Deirdre came running in from outside. She'd brought something she'd found in the fields to give to Lavacham, and she filled the house with her energy, her, her laughter, her lightness of spirit, that girlish energy which, as Lavacham watched her, she realised was on the cusp of becoming something else. Lavacham watched her going about her business, fossicking around the room, and Well, it wouldn't be long now. The king's last visit had been in summer, and already the world around the remote home of Lavachim and Deirdre had turned to winter. Thick snow silenced the land all around. It was one dark afternoon. Lavachim was sat by the hearth, busying herself with quite sure it was, what it was. Whilst Deirdre was sat at the window, spinning yarn from a drop spindle, when she had one of those moments, you know, you know those moments when for no apparent reason you suddenly know that you know something? I'm sure you do. Deirdre had a moment like that. Lavacham looked up, Alerted by the gasp that came from the girl and the clatter of the drop spindle as it hit the ground, she looked up and saw that Deirdre had raised herself in the seat and was leaning outwards towards the window. Over her shoulder, Lavacom could see what Deirdre was looking at. Outside in the snow, one of the old men that acted as servants had slaughtered a sheep. The gush of blood had stained the white snow crimson. A raven had landed and was now pecking at the blood. And in a faraway voice, Lavacham heard Deirdre say, I will love a man with those colours in his face, the white of the snow in his cheek, the red of the blood in his lips, and the black of the raven in his hair. I will love just such a man. Well, Lavacham frowned, but she didn't say anything. In six months, you say, the king leant forward in his high-backed chair, and the walls of his audience room seemed to creep closer as if they, too, wanted to listen. In six months' time, your majesty, Ireland will be in the height of summer. Ulster will be at her most beautiful. What better time to celebrate a royal wedding? Yes, I agree. Uh, and, and my bride? I is she ready? All her life, 
your majesty, Deirdre has been raised to know that a great day is coming. And now she is eager to take her place at your majesty's side. Eager, said the king. Eager. That sounds good. He was no longer looking at Lavacham, nor even quite at the floor in front of him. Instead, he appeared to be looking at some nowhere space between himself and the floor. Eager is good, certainly, no, and of course I will send a dressmaker to get the girl measured up and fitted out. I will have pavilions built and I will arrange uh, for the for the games and for the contests and for the concerts and, yeah, and all of this. What are you doing here? Go! Go! Waste no time. Go and continue making her ready. I will send it. Go! Waste no more time. And so Lavacham left. This man, once a baby in her arms, but now going grey-haired in majesty and power. She left him, and if I'm honest, she disobeyed. She did not go straight home. Instead, instead she allowed her feet to find their way to the exercise field outside Awan Macha, the hall of the Red Branch, where, as always, the Red Branch warriors were doing their training. It was always a spectacle worth looking at. And Lavachan looked around. People recognized her acknowledged her and bowed and she smiled back and she looked until ah there she saw fergus mcroy one of the king's three great champions cuchulain was probably away somewhere and connell that was connell over there but there was fergus fergus of the sincere tongue of whom it was said he was incapable of telling a lie fergus was supervising the training of the young warriors when i say that i mean children of about seven he was holding a baton out what for a grown-up would be knee-height, for Lavachum it would have been a little higher. And those young trainees were leaping from a standing position, and then at the peak of their jump, trying to reach with their feet the height of the baton, they would bring their wooden practice swords up and over their heads as they came back down to earth, and Lavachum smiled because they were practicing their salmon leap, one of the great feats of a warrior. Each jump concluded, Fergus would lift the baton higher. Then he saw Lavacham. He broke from the training and he walked towards her. His immense tattooed physique, made even bigger by the crest of stiffly spiked hair that topped it, dwarfed the old lady. And as he came towards her, he bent down onto one knee so that his face, also intricately tattooed, a fearsome mask, came very level with hers and then broke into the most sincere, the most engaging smile. Honoured Lavachum, what a pleasure to see you. Tell me, what brings you here among us? And Lavacham answered that she'd been to see the king about a little business, nothing important, but his majesty had been most gracious. And how is your charge? How is the king's intended? Well, Fergus was known for sin his sincere heart. In fact, as I said, it was widely held that he was incapable of telling a lie. And so feeling the question to be a sincere question, Lavacham answered sincerely. And really, it was such a pleasure to talk of Deirdre. She prattled on a little, I must admit. Fergus broke in, Why, Lavacham, you speak of her with such a glow in your face, it's as if you were talking about your own child. Well, I must admit that over the... <laughs> Forgive me, Fergus, I'm a silly old lady going on and on, and you're a busy warrior. I do think I get sillier with every year that passes. Can you imagine that? Yeah, you'd scarcely think it's possible, would you? But, Fergus, would you indulge an old lady's foolishness? Uh, if there's any way I can help, of course I will. Well, as I said, I do get sillier, but um, I must admit my eye has seen something I'd like to know. Could you tell me who that is over there. Fergus, his eyes followed the direction that Lavacom had indicated and... Ah, <laughs> yes, I see who you mean. Both of them were looking into a corner of the exercise field where a young man was exercising alone, stepping and moving through Movements of an almost balletic grace, movements which Lavacham knew at a different pace would be irresistibly lethal. He was a young man with pale skin, 
red lips and black hair. Ah, I see who you mean. That is Nisha McWishnach. He's the oldest of the sons of Wishnach. He's got two brothers, Arden and Anle. I don't know where they are, but that's Nisha through and through, always the most dedicated, always staying behind and tra training longer on his own. Yes, I see that, absolutely, only he's not really on his own, is he? <laughs> I see what you mean. No. Well, when you put it like that, Nisha is never really on his own. It was true. Fergus had seen what Lavachem meant. Whilst Nisha trained, there was a crowd of young boys who clearly hero-worshipped him, watching every single move he made. And that wasn't all. There were the palace women, serving girls and such like, who seemed to have found the means to either do their tasks or interrupt their tasks at a place where they could feast their eyes on the movements of this beautiful young man. And behind the curtained windows of palace apartments, Lavacom knew very well that palace women were also drinking this man with their eyes. No, well, when you put it like that, I suppose Nisha is never on his own. What a burden it must be to be beautiful, eh, Lavacom? You and I were spared that hardship, I think. <laughs> but no, you want to... Yeah, well, I, I do say I get silly. Could you... You want an introduction? Of course, of course. Come with me. At the other side of the exercise field, Nisha had finished his training and was now gathering up all his kit, getting ready to leave the field. He looked up and he saw Fergus approaching and with Fergus an old lady and deliberately cultivating a certain reserve. He carried on gathering up his kit and wondered to himself how long this was going to take. And he sort of half listened as the old lady prattled on about how of all the warriors that she'd seen, he seemed to her to be the most dedicated. He answered without looking up that he couldn't speak for other warriors, but he didn't take the business of being a warrior of the Red Branch lightly. Does it worry you then, said the old fool, that some of your spectators do? What? Nisha looked up. He was listening now. Well, only I couldn't help but notice that... Some of your spectators appeared to be admiring you for something other, perhaps, than your military prowess. I wish Nisha flushed red. He was still young enough to blush. And answered that he, he, he had no idea why people, or even if people, looked at him whilst he was training. A warrior's concentration had to be as sharp as his sword, even sharper. And then aware that he sounded a little pompous, he blushed some more. He, he didn't look up again. He continued attending to his t kit. Whilst the old lady prattled on about how, if he was interested, she knew a place, a secluded place, where he could train in secret, unobserved by anybody. It was a place in a forest far from here. And in the forest there was a clearing. And in the clearing, near the clearing, there was a, f a, a stream. In the stream there was a ford where he could practice his dueling. And in the middle of the clearing there was a dead oak tree which he could use to throw his arrows at or fire his spears at, which just showed how much she knew about warfare. And, and in such a place he could train without ever being troubled by any spectators at all. And it was the damnedest thing. But once the old fool had gone, Nisha found himself replaying in his mind the directions she'd given him to find that place. Deirdre was in the fringes of the forest hunting for mushrooms. Lavacham loved to cook with wild mushrooms, but nowadays she complained. Her eyes were too weak for the seeing and her back too stiff for the stooping, and in any case she'd long since taught Deirdre everything she needed to know about the, the skill of hunting for mushrooms, and it was true. Actually, it was a task that Deirdre loved, one of her favourites. She loved using her intelligence, her skill and her discernment to feed them both. And so, she'd been working most of the morning and her bag was pretty much full. Her eyes had long since become accustomed to the dim light of the forest floor and to distinguishing this brown from that brown and spotting and collecting the waxy caps of good edible mushrooms. And at a certain point, as she was reaching for another mushroom, a sudden flash of light 
through the trees, seemed to split the forest, it was so bright, it blinded her. And then another, and another. And Deirdre blinked out the dazzlement and looked, and then she heard a sound that she hadn't noticed before, soft thumps, like footfall, a whooshing sound, as if somebody was swinging a flail in air. And then she heard grunts of exertion, a man's voice, her skin prickling with alarm and excitement, her heart beating hard. Deirdre ran stealthily to a hiding place where she could see into the clearing. And when she could, what she saw, what she saw was a vision, fate itself made flesh. The universe stood still for a moment as Deirdre saw a man with the white of the skin in his face, the red of the blood in his lips, and the black of the raven in his hair. From her hiding place she watched as he crossed, quartered, circled the clearing, swinging his bright sword in the air, and every time his sword swung it seemed to catch and fling light in all directions. And she watched as he threw his sword high up above him in the air, did a forward roll, righted himself in time to catch the sword as it came back down, and then swung all around him in a great low slash, and then leapt into the air a salmon leap, his feet almost as high as a man's chest, and then brought his sword up and over his head with a ferocity like a whip crack, with a strength that Deirdre feared would cleave the air itself. She gasped, and in that moment, as he landed, his eyes were on hers. Their eyes met, and the universe stood still for a second time that morning. His mouth moved as if he was about to speak. His hand twitched in anticipation of a gesture, and Deirdre ran. <laughs>